Here we go. Gerson scores! Gordy Gerson wins it on the overtime penalty shootout. What's going on, everybody? This is MASL Monday. Welcome to all those listening on Sirius XM FC Channel 157 and watching on MASL TV on YouTube and on Twitch. I'm Alex Bastiavansky, bringing you all the best uh, action and analysis from the Major Arena Soccer League. And uh, it is a great day. I'm joined by the play-by-play -play man for both Utica City FC and the MASL games on uh, Sirius XM FC, Mr. Ray Biggs. Ray, how you doing, buddy? Doing spectacular. How about yourself? I mean, this is about as good as I can possibly feel on a uh, Monday afternoon, so I got no complaints. It's Monday morning for me, my friend, here on the West Coast. So uh, coffee has been my friend so far after a lovely weekend and busy weekend for you and uh, your boys in Utica, great weekend. We're going to start with with that. Um, the weekend that you guys had two games and also a discussion about sort of how your team has done this season because it's been an interesting one uh, for, for UCFC this season. But let's start with um, the, the big game for you guys. Statement game facing the Florida Tropics. 5-4 win for you guys. Talk about the game and what you saw. Well, for sure. I think it was a story of resiliency for both of these sides. It was a well-played game, 5-4 the final score. And Florida, to their credit, came out with a solid defensive start. They had a solid game plan in terms of how they wanted to dictate the tempo, which was especially important because Clay Roberts was suspended off of a red card. Uh, Anthony Arrico had to step in, one of the players for the Tropics. He had to coach the team. And I thought Florida opened with a fairly focused first 15 20 minutes and even carrying a little bit further towards halftime they get the two nothing lead carvalho and uh joey tavernisi scoring against his former team set up by another former utica city player in alan carventura jr um and it seemed like all the momentum was headed their way and to the credit of utica quentin swift delivered an absolute dart from the right wing to get the momentum kind of back equalized a little bit I think it was 2-1 at halftime Carvalho scores that big goal to start the third but then it was like Utica threw the switch and took over the game a little bit with that greasy goal by Fernandez off of uh, George Navarrete who just mishandled the ball in the box it was kind of a strange one but it came off his feet Fernandez playing all the way to the whistle got to give him credit for that especially as a rookie that's a habit that's hard to teach um, that was really kind of the spark plug. And then Bo Yelovitz scores twice. That first one off for Gordy Gerson was an absolute beauty yeah. right off of a restart. Both those goals on set pieces. And that's one principal area that Utica has been so much better, I think, than they were a year ago is the set pieces. Everton Marrera, the head coach, so careful not to take credit for that. He always gives the credit to first to his players there. And you know what? All the pieces have come together between his play design and what the players are executing on the field. Those two goals uh, put Utica in front. They give up the late one to Drew Ruggles for Florida and then Gordy Gerson, yet again, fifth game winner of the year in overtime, scores well, it on a penalty kick. And Gordy has just been incredible. We're going to get to more about Gordy in a second, who's, who's definitely a front runner, should be for the most viable player this season. We'll quickly just talk about um, the other game, which is not a throwaway game uh, against on Friday against Harrisburg, a team is, well, you know, we're going to talk about further on in the show. If teams take this team too lightly, it is a huge mistake. Um, as they proved this weekend against another squad that you guys are battling it out with for a playoff position in St. Louis. But you guys win the game 7-4. Just give 20 seconds, 30 seconds, your analysis of that game. Well, first and foremost, I think when you get to a time like this in the season, you've got to have those depth guys that step up for you. I mean, Utica showed that, I think, a few weeks ago in their uh, home win against Baltimore, a game in which they had to go to some depth guys down the lineup who found ways to contribute. Uh, Alex Gomez, who was the first overall pick in the draft. Keaton Woods, who hasn't really played a lot. Those guys stepped up big time. 
for Utica against Baltimore. Well, down in Harrisburg, Isak Soma, his second year with the team, he's shown flashes of brilliance in that time as a ball handler. He's incredibly just fantastic at getting north-south. He's got some of the best wheels in the league. And he put on a show with a couple of goals. And that really set the tone, I think, for you to could have finished the job there. And then the other piece of the puzzle, of course, Andrew Coughlin, who since February the 1st, guy's been you look at the performances that Utica has put on, he's been a big part of it. I mean, every game that they've won, Coughlin place, has started and he's let up five or less in every single one of those wins. Yeah. So overall this season, uh, you and I were laughing before the show about the fact that if someone had told you that you guys would be five points out of first place, you thought playoffs, uh, probably, you know, this, this season, this is a playoff team. But if someone had told you you'd be five points out of first place at this time of the season, you would have thought that they were that they were doing something shady, or you know, I, because you didn't think it was it was in all likelihood, especially with the way that Florida had played last year, being so bloody dominant. But talking about you guys, take us through this season so far and what you've seen from this UCFC team. Well, for sure, I think that. There was a little bit of an up and down factor out of the gate with this team, and there was going to be that to some extent. You go, you go in, you bring in a new coach, your roster gets completely retooled. Um, it's just an entirely different vibe to start the season. And Everton and Tommy Tanner, the general manager, really did a great job, I think, of committing to the long term vision, committing to the long term process of the season and what could be down the line. And the progress here in the second half of the year has just been so evident, especially again, they get out of the month of January and really start to find a groove in the past month or so. And the belief in some of the players that they've brought in has paid off immensely. Gordy Gerson having an unbelievable season to date, and we'll get more into that later. Stefan Miatrovic coming in. Get into it now, man. Tell us about Gordy and the season he's having because by the definition of most valuable player, um, with all due respect to some of the big scorers in the league, though, but looking, I love Frank Tayu. Frank Tayu is going to be a front runner for MVP. Absolutely. Um, he's leading the league in scoring. He's an absolute beast, but he's on a team that's pretty loaded this year uh, offensively as well. Um, I look at Gordy and then I look at the, the scoring on, uh, you know, for, for Utica City so far this season. And uh, Gordy is far and away the leading scorer on the squad uh, at this point. And uh, he's got 37 points. Well, Bo Yelovac is second with 19 points. That is a huge spread. Gordy's been doing a lot by himself offensively this season. And to me, that's a good reason why he should be considered a front runner for MVP. Yeah, and in a lot of respects, he's really kind of resumed being the dominant player on his respective roster after a few years where he really didn't have to do that he only had he had 21 points in 11 games with florida so let's be clear he was pretty dominant in his run there before it came to kind of an abrupt end and then last year 18 points in 22 with milwaukee kind of a down year he comes to utica and wouldn't you know it he's kind of in a way reinvented his career a little bit here i mean he's always been a great player he's been over 50 points before he's been around the 50 point mark i think like three times including that 58 point year with orlando and that's the kind of player that utica was expecting to see kind of return into form when he signed and their faith in him has been wholly rewarded i know he's got a good relationship with everton Marrera. everton's faith in him is really uh, getting rewarded here. Tommy Tanner's faith in him is getting rewarded. The man's got 19 goals. Five of them are game winners. He's got the game winners in half of Utica's victories this season. His power play numbers, I mean, he's got the couple of penalty shootout goals that have been huge for this team. In fact, I think he scored on three of them this year. Um, just outstanding stuff. Outstanding stuff. Uh just in 30 seconds here, because we've got to move on to uh, the rest of the East and the West, of course. But something you'd like to point out is that they've really battened down the hatches over the past month and a half, though, haven't they? Yes, yes, they have. And first of all, it's the commitment to team defense. And one of the things in the process of the season that really had to happen for Utica City, Everton Marrera, I was talking to him in January, and he said, principally speaking, the one thing that this side has to do better 
to get the defensive numbers under control was because of the free flowing style of their offense, they have to get guys back and marking on bodies in transition. The runners have to be tracked at all times. You cannot allow those runners to get behind you when you're making your way back because it is a very offensively oriented style. And two things have happened. First of all, Utica is getting better at marking those transition runs. They're not quite as porous back there as they were at the start of the season. Actually, there's three things. The second of which is, of course, the returns of Darren Toby, or return of Darren Toby. And they bring in Stefan Miatovich from St. Louis, who is just an unbelievable 2 way defender. Yeah. And then Andrew Coughlin has really kind of rounded back into the best version of himself in between the pipes. And those three things have made such a decisive difference on Utica's opportunities to go in games. They don't necessarily, if you're talking their offensive tempo, they don't necessarily have to push the pace all the time just to keep up with a team because they've had a couple of breakdowns. Now they can play at a varying speed depending upon how the flow of the game is unfolding and go from there. And they have a lot more options when they're defending well. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So it's been, it's been a very interesting season so far for Utica. I think a team on the upswing as the playoffs draw closer. Um, let's quickly go over, uh, first of all, Baltimore Blast beating KC 5-4. Big win for Baltimore, just their second win on the road so far this season. Um, and William Van Zale, a first star of the game. Willie V has won the Defensive Player of the Week award. Two of the last three weeks, he might make it three of four. This guy's just been insane, hasn't he? Yeah, and in a lot of respects, you have to be a great shot stopper to play in this league to begin with. I mean, 21 of 25 is no small feat for William Vanzella. And that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. And think about this. His season numbers are just an interesting test case because of the field dimensions in Baltimore, because of where they play. He's getting a lot more leather thrown at him than most other teams in the league on most nights because of the tight quarters nature of that field. And I think it really battle tests you. It puts you in a position where you have to be 100% uh, all the time, full go, to make something happen for your team, knowing that the opportunities are going to be a little bit higher quality. And that prepares you to go on the road and win games. And right now, one thing that the teams in the East haven't really been doing is going on the road and winning games. The road records across the Eastern Division right now are not particularly uh, sparkling. Well, as we mentioned, Baltimore, that was just their second win on the road this season, so that was absolutely massive for the Blast. Uh, Kansas City did pick up a win this weekend, though, 8-6 over the Milwaukee Wave. Interesting stuff. I mean, great win for Kansas City, but the Wave have now lost three of their last four games. You keep waiting for an Eastern team to really grab something by the throat here and take control of the conference, and it just has not happened this season. But a uh, big win for KC there. Yeah, it certainly adds some uh, entertainment value for us now, doesn't it? Um, to kind of be in this position here where we've got – this spread, this very tight spread of points up and down the Eastern Division standings. And Kansas City just adds to that complexity with the win. Um, worth noting, of course, Tito Favela had to step in and play a lot of minutes in that game. And he was spectacular, at least about as spectacular as you can expect a guy off the bench to be, kind of your third string in the organization. Yeah, huge. Um, so to be able to get those minutes from him was huge. And again, they shut off the top team of the division. And there just seems to be a little bit more uh, cayenne pepper going into the soup here. It's getting spicier and spicier as we uh, get into it the is. final four or five games of the year. It is getting spicy. And we should mention, of course, we talked about Harrisburg, how you cannot take them lightly. Harrisburg taking down the St. Louis ambush 6-5. The ambush, of course, we're trying to chase you guys down for the fifth um, spot in the in the East, which is going to do a, a playoff game against uh, – um, the, the fourth the fourth seed in the conference. So you need that fifth spot, which you guys are in. Is St. Louis now, I mean, is this, you know, are they all but done with the amount of games left in the season and the points that they've got to make up to get to catch you guys for fifth place? Yeah, well, the fir first and foremost thing is they don't have any games left against Utica, which would obviously be a huge factor at this point in the year. I mean, they did take care of business when they did come up to Central New York a few weeks back. In fact, it was 
a very tough game to watch from the Utica side. St. Louis did a nice job of slowing everybody down in the absence of their head coach, Jeff Locker, that day, to their credit. But they just have not been consistent enough here down the second half of the season, down the stretch at a time when Utica's been hot, Baltimore's heating up. Some of those teams in front of them, and of course, Kansas City was off to a really strong start to begin with. Those teams in front of them are taking care of enough of their business where St. Louis hasn't been able to control their controllables and kind of claw their way back up. And these last couple of weeks, they've lost some serious ground. So I do think, in all honesty, it's going to be a uh, tough hill to climb and they're Seven probably going to have to win out. Seven points behind. I mean, it's, yeah, no question about it. So, so you're saying there's a chance, but uh, it's it's going to be a, a tough road to hold for sure. Let's switch to the West now because the two games that everybody had their eye on last week were the Empire Striker, Empire Strikers games, uh, one against Chihuahua, one against San Diego, the two front runners in the West alongside Empire, who had such a terrible start to the season, but have been red hot. One of, if not the hottest team uh, in the MASL over the past couple of months, the Empire Strikers. And this was like a put up or shut up moment. This was a silence the critics moment against these two teams. And quickly, Chihuahua 6 5 Empire takes that game uh, with a big comeback in the fourth quarter, down by four goals to tie it up. Just a character win, a statement win for the Strikers. Yeah, absolutely. And for, for Empire, just kind of confirming what I think we already know about this team. Anytime, anywhere, flip-flops in a parking lot, they don't care that the talent level on this team, this Empire team, is off the charts. And for sure, it's the type of team that I know San Diego has been incredibly dominant. Empire was right there in that last game. They've beaten San Diego before this year. I think that if there's a team that could really kind of upset the apple cart out west and take what they think is theirs, it's the Empire Strikers. I mean, they've added so many great pieces to an already solid roster. The Taiyu boys, of course, have been there as kind of one of the mainstays. Costa, who's all but got Rookie of the Year, I think I'm locked down at this point. Mo, Mo NDI, NDI with a huge pickup. Mo NDI, just a great pickup. One of the pickups of the year, no question about it. But that is a huge win by them over the Chihuahua Savage. And then they take on the San Diego Soccers uh, the next day. And I'll tell you what, they didn't win the game. San Diego took it 8-7. But, man, just another great performance. A great game, first of all. Both teams just... You know, uh, just laying it all on the line, and uh, another fourth goal come, four goal comeback in the fourth quarter for the Strikers. Uh, ultimately, it's Christian Gutierrez with the game-winning goal, but uh, just a, a, a great, great game. And Gabriel Costa, three goals, three assists, six points so far. Uh, so, no, pardon me, six points in the game. First star. We talked about him before. Is he your front runner for Rookie of the Year? Gift wrap it, put it on his doorstep. At this point, I uh, don't think that there's anybody else that can get their way into that conversation. I think he's uh, got it taken care of out there. He has been unbelievable. And he got married this year, too, by the way. That's why he missed their uh, road trip, of, which we, we said was probably the greatest excuse for ever missing a road trip. But uh, back in, uh, I believe it was in December, uh, 34 points in 15 games for the rookie so far this season so yeah incredible stuff uh great game against uh, san diego both ways the soccer's taking it in overtime but we couldn't ask for more uh we should mention as well tacoma going oh for mexico they had a chance they were just a point behind monterey and fifth for fifth spot entering the week and they had their chance and they just couldn't make it happen they lost both in chihuahua and in monterey yeah, and what was interesting, I mean, they were in it, especially in that uh, that Monterey game. They were in that game, and I looked at the box score, and something immediately stood out. And Similar to your it, game. It <laughs> seems an awful lot like what happened to Utica in Monterey. Yeah. I mean, yeah. close game, four, third quarter, four, four, they four, blow four, the doors four, off. Four, quarter, right? 4-4 four, four in the third quarter, you guys were tied. And then, so. what was the final? Was it 14-4? Uh, yes. 14-4, unbelievable. Believe so. to, a lot of parallels between that and Tacoma's game. Yeah, absolutely. And it was just like, I, I thought I was watching instant replay of uh, of what had happened down there in Mexico to Utica. So, 
Monterey looking as well like a team that Can't is count absolutely them. a threat late in the season. They're only kind of sitting around that 10, that 10 win mark right now, kind of in the conversation to finish around 500. But that's another team that could rock the boat. Yeah, for sure. And as San Diego became the first uh, team in the MASL to clinch a playoff spot, uh, by the way, the last week as well, they've got a five-point lead over Chihuahua, for uh, who's second in the Western Conference. But, oh, man, the Western playoffs are just going to be insane this year. It's going to be so much fun to watch. Um, let's. So we talked a little bit about MVP. We thought, you know, Frank is definitely going to be up there. Gordy Gerson, definite consideration. Lucas Roque, another guy on a team that's, you know, uh, Baltimore is is not as much of a powerhouse this season as a team like like Empire or San Diego, but they're, they've been looking to a guy like Lucas yeah. Roque to get the job done statistically for them all season long. He's got to be in the conversation. But keep an eye on the Baltimore Blast, especially lately with some of the roster moves that they've well, they're made. They're winning on the road now too, right? So I Yeah, mean, they get that win on the road. Lucas Roque, though, just a consistent primetime performer. One of the best, one of the very best target forwards in this entire league that you kind of have to account for at all times when he's on the field. He had 26 goals a season ago in 21 games, and you think, you know, how could he possibly top that after he had 25 uh, going back to 2014 15? Those are two of his best years right there, and you're thinking, okay, what has he got for an encore? Well, the answer is he's already five points ahead of where he was last year in two less games. He's got more goals. He's got three game winners, so he's starting to come up in the clutch. In fact, he gets one more game winning goal this season. He ties the rest of his career. Yeah. At least in the regular season, which is huge. I want to quickly throw some. I mean, looking at this, you know what? It's it, ultimately, though, at the end of the day, this award might be Nick Pereira's to lose. Um, I said before, Tayu is leading the lead in scoring. I was half right. I meant goal scoring, actually. Overall in points, though. Uh, the leader this year is Nick Pereira with 52 points. That's seven points ahead of Frank Tayu right now. If you look at scoring on the Tacoma roster, Nick Pereira has 52 points in 17 games. Second on the team is Jamil Cox with 18 points. It's not even close in the league. Um, the scoring differential between first and second on any team. Uh, Nick Pereira has been trying to will that team into the playoffs. It's going to be very, very difficult, though, for Tacoma at this point. But uh, I'm not sorry. I mean, I, there's no time for you to even comment on that one because we got to move on. But I had to get that in there. Just Nick, uh, what an incredible season he's having. So kudos to him. We got to keep him in the conversation. We've got to look at your power rankings, sir. And these have been a lot of fun over the last few weeks. It always gets people talking. Dallas, uh, number 14. Harrisburg, number 13. No surprise there um, with with the teams you've listed. Uh, St. Louis, you've got at 12. Uh, Tacoma at 11. And uh, it's interesting. You've got Mesquite all the way down at number 10. Tell us a bit about that. Oh, I figured I should give them a little bit more credit than I think Tom Wynn did last week. Um, yeah, exactly. But they haven't had, in my opinion, the best second half of the season there in Mesquite. So, meanwhile... Some of those, you look at right now, what I've got five through nine, all those Eastern teams, you could throw a blanket over them, I think, right now in terms of just how competitive that they've been. But somebody out West kind of had to take the fall for that. And it's not necessarily a knock on Mesquite because they can compete with every single one of those four or five teams in front of them. Right. Clearly, you think that Monterey is trending in the right direction because uh, you've got them at four, but we'll get to that in a second. You've got Florida at nine. Your uh, UCFC at eight, KC at seven, uh, Milwaukee, who's first place in the East. You've got them at number six, but then you've got the Blast at number five, which is your top Eastern team. And right now, it's just a matter of Milwaukee's lost three out of their last four. Baltimore beat Milwaukee 11 to three a few weeks ago, which, of course, you know, one game, it's really tough to necessarily make the entire judgment off of that one game, of course. And I'm certainly not trying to do that here. It certainly does add another maybe log or so on the fire, though. Um, but Baltimore, they're starting to heat up here. Second half of the season, they're getting back into the form of maybe being the best team in the East. They've had their hiccups. Of course, Utica defeated them with 
a slightly de depleted roster that particular day in Central New York, although they were not immune to that either in Baltimore. William didn't make that trip. Just a case of right now, I think the Baltimore Blast are the better performing team out of the two. Again, you go back, you look into those power rankings, and I realistically think you can throw a blanket right now on that, on that conglomerate of Eastern teams from five to nine. Any one of those teams could take it. Any of them could win, for sure. You clearly think, uh, real quick, you you think the Monterey is trending in the right direction because you've got them at number four, uh, even though they are in the standings, they're fifth. They're uh, four points behind Mesquite, but you've got them at number four in your power rankings. Well, the big reason, I think, is the way that they've been trending lately. It's a team that can obviously put the ball in the back of the net. Daniel Vallel is having a great year for them basically on loan from uh, the Harrisburg Heat. Castillo has been really good for them. Just a really, really balanced scoring team. Even if they don't really have that, what's the word I'm looking for here, that star player, that star striker at the top end, they have balance. It comes from everywhere. Oh yeah, and they've won their last three. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, I should mention, because I don't think I have for the last, well, at any point in the show since the start, you are listening to MASL Monday with Alex Vasjevansky, and I'm joined by uh, Ray Biggs, who's the play-by-play -play man for the Utica, for UCFC, Utica City, and uh, for the uh, MASL on Sirius XM FC Channel 157. And just to finish off the power rankings here, we've got Empire at three, um, Chihuahua at number two, and San Diego at number one. And we're going to wrap things up with the, uh, let's do goal of the week and favorite, uh, favorite moment of the week. And give us your goal of the week first. Well, my goal of the week definitely goes back to that Utica, Florida match yesterday on Sunday. Gordy Gerson setting up Bo Yelovitz right off a restart to tie up the game. Just an unbelievable play. It was crisp. It was direct. And Bo was perfectly placed to put that away. And it definitely kind of made sure that Utica built on the momentum created by the Fernandez goal. I would argue that that goal, as much as anything, is the reason that they were able to come back and win that game. Right. I will take uh, Gabriel Costa, the uh, possible rookie of the year against San Diego, the fifth goal of the game. Just an absolute banger from beyond the yellow line. Gorgeous strike by the Empire youngster and uh, your moment of the week. Uh, give it to us, Ray. I think it was uh, Tito Favela coming in for Kansas City to close that out. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a tough place to be in. It's actually a place Milwaukee knew all too well a few weeks ago when uh, Willie B went down and they had to bring in Augie Ray. And Tito Favela, the numbers aren't quite as impressive. Of course, it wasn't a shutout, but Tito steps in there third string keeper in the organization first place team on the other side he does enough to get the win and it that to me is a colossal yeah. moment in its own right for the kansas city comments big moment and i'll take mine you know what i'll take the second win on the road of the season for the baltimore blast which is going to be so important for them uh, as the playoffs approach but in that game the moment for me was great great decision making by the officials because Kansas City scored what they thought was the tying goal late in the fourth quarter the play goes to review the referees take a look at it and they got the call right the ball went out of bounds came back in the ball player put the ball down but the ball was not stationary the ball was still moving and uh, even uh, Eric Berger and uh, Nick Vassos and KC were saying good call by the ref right call they got the call right heartbreaking for Kansas City but uh, elated, obviously, the Baltimore Blast were after that. And that is uh, it, my friend. We have got to wrap things up as we're just about out of time. But uh, first of all, just a reminder that MASL Monday, every Monday night on Sirius X XMFC Channel 157 um, at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific time. For everyone who wants to watch games, uh, everything we've been talking about live and all the archives, the games can be seen on Twitch. And uh, the show as well can be seen on Twitch and on MASL TV on YouTube. Ray, it is going to be so much fun to watch you guys down the stretch this season, uh, especially with the defense playing so much better now. Uh, that blue turf in Utica, those uh, fantastic fans, one of the best atmospheres in the league. 
Uh, you do a great job, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today. Yeah, no problem. Excited for uh, what's to come yet in the Eastern Division, including in Utica. All right, buddy. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm Alex Bashevansky. We will see you next Monday on MAS on Monday.